Hello and welcome to the next episode of the Software Carpentry Lecture on Program Design using Invasion Percolation as an example. In this episode, which will be a rather long one, we'll take a look at how to speed up the program we've developed. Our program now works correctly. At least, it passes all of our tests. The next step is to figure out if we need to make it faster. If it's already fast enough to generate the results we need, we should spend our time doing other things. Well, how do we measure a program's speed anyway? One possibility is to take the average of running it over and over again on grids of various sizes. But that won't necessarily help us predict the running time on larger grids. Instead, we're going to use a technique called asymptotic analysis, which is one of the most powerful theoretical tools in all of computer science. Our n by n grid has n squared cells. We have to fill at least n of those cells to reach the boundary. But in the worst case, we can fill as many as n minus 2 squared plus 1, or n squared minus 4n plus 5 cells, to hit the boundary. Now for large n, this is approximately n squared. The ratio between n squared and the polynomial shown above goes to 1 as n gets very large. Our program has to look at n squared cells each time it wants to find the next cell to fill. Right now, we sweep over x equals 0 to range n and y equals 0 to range n. The product of those two is n squared. So the best case filling time is n times n squared, or n cubed steps in total. The worst case filling time is n squared times n squared, or n to the fourth steps in total. That's bad news. Averaging the exponents of n cubed and n to the fourth to get n to the 3.5 doesn't make a lot of sense, but it will illustrate our problem. Here are some grid sizes, and the time it would take to fill a grid of that size if, on average, filling takes n to the 3.5 steps. To make these numbers a little bit more realistic, let's add another column and a few more rows. If filling a grid of size n takes one second, then filling a grid that's 100 times as large on each axis will take 115 days. That's a pretty steep cost, because we may need to run our simulation hundreds or even thousands of times to generate good statistics about the fractals it creates. So here's an idea. Why are we always looking at all of the cells in the grid? Why don't we just look at the cells that might be adjacent to the filled region? We can keep track of the minimum and maximum x and y coordinates of the area filled so far and just loop over the cells that are one less or one greater on each axis. Well, this isn't going to help us very much. On average, the filled region is about half the size of the grid. So n over 2 times n over 2 is n squared over 4. This means that our 115 day run has been brought down to 29 days. The bad news is that if we go to a grid that's 148n by 148n, we're back to our 115 days again because of that exponent. We need to find a way to attack that exponent. Well, here's another thought. If we've just added the cell shown in dark green, why are we bothering to check all of the cells shown in yellow? We already know that the cells shown in red are candidates because they're adjacent to cells that we've already checked. We've only got one new candidate cell to add to that set. And this leads us to one of the big ideas in programming. You can trade memory for time and vice versa, i.e. you can record redundant information in order to save recalculation as a way of making algorithms faster. In this case, we're going to keep a list of the cells that are on the boundary of the region we've filled so far. Now, that's redundant information because everything we're recording is also already in the grid. Each time a cell is filled, we will check its neighbors. If those neighbors are already in the list, we won't do anything. We won't re-add them to our list of neighboring cells. But if any of the cells aren't already in the list, we will put them in. In fact, we will insert them in order to ensure that the cells with lowest value are always at the front of the list. This makes it easy to choose the next cell to fill. 
we just look at all of the cells at the front of the list with equal lowest value and pick one of them at random. An example will make this clearer. The list of cells on the edge is initially empty because we haven't filled anything in the grid. When we fill the center cell, we add its neighbors to the list. And when we add a neighbor, we add the value as well as the coordinates. We then take the next cell from the front of the list, fill it, and add its neighbors again. Now notice that we're always keeping the list sorted by increasing value. That way, the candidates for filling are always at the front of the list. And of course, if a cell is already in the list, we never add it a second time. And in case of ties, we find all the cells at the front of the list with the lowest value and pick one of those at random to fill. Well, how quickly can we insert a value into a sorted list? Here's a simple algorithm. We set i equal to zero and then look upwards through the list. As soon as we see a value in the list that is greater than or equal to the value we've got, we break out of the loop and insert our cell there. And if you check the documentation for the list.insert method, you'll see that this function does the right thing even when the list is empty or when the new value is greater than all of the existing values in the list, i.e. when we're appending the new record to the end of the list. Well, if a list has k values, then on average, if we're inserting things in the middle, it'll take about k over two steps. Now, our fractals fill somewhere between n and n squared cells, so again, we're going to cheat and average those exponents to say that we fill about n to the 1.5 cells. And there are about as many cells on the boundary as there are in the fractal itself. So using this list, we're going to fill n to the 1.5 cells. And each time we do that, it's going to take about n to the 1.5 steps to insert neighbors into the list. The product is n cubed steps. That's not much of an improvement over n to the 3.5, but it turns out there's a much faster way to do this. Imagine you want to look up a name in a phone book. You open the book in the middle, and if the name there comes after the one you want, you go to the middle of the first half, and if the name in the middle comes before the one you want, you go to the second half. You then repeat this procedure in that half of the phone book, subdividing and subdividing until you find the name that you're after. And this diagram shows the steps that you go through. How fast is this procedure? Well, one probe can find one value, two probes can find one value among two, three probes can find one value among four, four probes can find one among eight, and in general, k probes can find one value among two to the k. Turning that around, log base two of n probes is enough to find a place in a list of n values. And that means that the running time for our algorithm will be about n to the 1.5 times log base two of n to the 1.5. The first n to the 1.5 is the number of times we fill a cell, and log base 2 of n to the 1.5 is the number of steps it takes each time we fill a cell to find the right place to insert. Now if we take out the constants, we wind up with n to the 1.5 times log 2 of n, because of course log 2 of n to the 1.5 is just 1.5 times log 2 of n. And this changes things quite a bit. Let's highlight the greatest values in each column what was a running time of 115 days has become a running time of two hours. What's more, as n gets bigger, the ratio gets bigger as well. The divide and conquer technique we use to insert values into a list is called binary search. Now it only works if the list values are sorted, but it keeps the list values sorted. And there's a Python implementation of this in the bisect library. Are we done? No. We can do even better. Generating a grid of n squared values takes n squared steps. After all, we have to create n squared random numbers. But if we fill the cell shown in green, we only ever look at the cell shown in green plus the cell shown in yellow. So why are we bothering to generate values for the cells shown in red? Why do we ever create those cells at all? Instead of storing the grid as a list of lists, we can store it as a dictionary. The keys in the dictionary are the xy coordinates of cells. The values are the current values of those cells. 
instead of looking things up directly as grid subscript x subscript y, we use a function get value that takes grid x y and the random range as arguments. And to understand why we need the random range, take a look at the implementation of that function. If the coordinate x y is not in the grid, i.e. if it's not already a key in the dictionary called grid, then we create a random value in 1 to z and store that with the key x comma y. We then return the value that we just created. And of course, if the coordinates x, y are already a key in the grid, then we'll skip the if and just return the value that's there. This is an example of another commonly used way to optimize programs. It's called lazy evaluation. We're not computing values until they're actually needed. We only ever generate the random numbers that we're going to use. Now, this does make the program more complicated, but it also makes it a lot faster. What we're doing is trading human time, i.e. programming effort, for higher machine performance. And this again is a very common theme in computing. The moral of the story? The biggest performance gains always come from changing algorithms and data structures, not from tweaking loops or rearranging conditionals. The other moral to this story is that if you want to write a program that's fast, you start by writing a program that's simple you then test it and improve it piece by piece, reusing the tests to check your work at each stage.